Um, my name is Baran Korkut, and as Dutoja mentioned, uh, I come from a company which is very much related to business modeling. Uh, Dutoja is the earliest adapter of the business model canvas in Turkey. He was the first Turkish member of the business model hub. And where I come from, my company, Business Model Zinc, is founded by the person who made all this possible. Patrick van der Paal, the founder and CEO of Business Model Zinc, found out about Alex's work and tried to convince him to come to Amsterdam and do a couple of seminars. And afterwards, he really tried really hard to convince him to write a book. And Patrick was a producer of the book, thus the name Business Model Zinc of my company. And I'm the Turkish partner of that company since two years. Uh, a little bit about me, i a uh, mechanical engineering major. I actually wanted to do industrial design, but we had the two entrance exam things back in the day. I was the last victim of that. And probably by just one question, I missed it. So I decided I'm going to do a double major, but at the first year, I realized that I'm not going to be able to graduate from a single major, let alone do a double major. So I got along with it. And I got a degree in mechanical engineering followed by an MBA. During that time, I was doing all this uh, personality traits, um, inventories, and everything else, which told me that I should be a designer, I should be an architect, or I should be a sculptor. But at the end of today, I became a strategy consultant with really big names, actually, who's a wizard with Excel sheets and just doing business plans. And at some point, I met the Business Model Generation book. And reading about the canvas, learning about the canvas, it just hit me that there is something about the design world, design methodology, that is really applicable to the business world. And while I was thinking about this, of course, I wasn't the smartest person in the world. Somebody else thought about this before, which was Steve Lang and the likes of him. I'm not going to be talking about Steve Lang and his methodologies of entrepreneurship, which I believe we will hear about it during this class. Somebody already thought about this. And somebody actually started a business about this, which was Business Model Zinc. So two years ago, uh, while I was a partner at the strategy house, I just quit. And I said, this is, this is definitely not what I want to do because I, the best I can do with my clients is take them to the level of the best practices and the benchmarks that I present to them. They cannot make a leap. And in the meantime, I realized the only way that I can enable them to make a leap was to give them the design thinking, show them the design methodologies and how it applies to business how it applies to strategy. So today, the message is one size does not fit all. Why I'm saying this? Because this is, this is a fact, first of all. There is no one true solution anymore in anywhere you look at it. And also, within companies, there are different solutions to a single problem. Within industries, there's no industrial norms anymore. And industry operates in different phases, different stages. There are different business models within an industry. And each have success factors, each have viable revenue streams, each have viable profitabilities. And now, I'm, today, I'm going to give you a little bit of examples to give you perspective about some different solutions within the same industry and how it translates to the business model camps. So this is less, this is going to be less like a lecture, but more like I'm, I will try to give you some perspectives on how to use the tool and what to look for when you're looking at different businesses and maybe one day when you're looking at your own startup, hopefully. And also, I'm, I'm going to try to conclude with a couple of messages that I think are really simple, like really stupid simple, but also really important. So the industry we will talk about today is the music industry. Who listens to music? Who likes music? This is pretty much the only universal thing on the face of the planet which appeals to everybody. So everybody's into music, right? So what about the music business? Well, it's a business. It's an established business. It has three distinct main stakeholders. One is the people that create the music, the creative junk, the artists, the bands, the composers, and all those people. And there are people who compose, uh, consume the music which is the fans. And also there's other people, the companies, the corporations in the music business, the recording companies. So this is very, in a nutshell, the framework. 
So we can just go ahead and put all those stuff in their relevant places in the business model canvas and say, okay, now we understand the music business. But actually that's not the case. Today we will look at the business music industry with the perspective of two, four really distinct, distinctively different business models. One is the recording company. What is the recording company? Recording companies, the Universals, the Sony Musics, the um, Aftermath Records of Dre, all those companies are called recording companies. So what do their business models look like? Actually, the record company is a very, very traditional company. It's designed based on what it's supposed to do. So when we look at the business model of Canvas, it's based, it's designed based on the key activities key resources and key activities that it has to do. What is the key activity of a record company? What do they do? Recording. Sorry? Recording. Recording. That's, that's pretty much the aftermath of what they do, but yeah, that's true. The main activity that they do is the key resources that they have. They are looking for star artists. They are looking for wonderful, star, number one, hit chart, all that kind of adjectives, those types of artists. And their key resources are copywriting everything out of their creative products. So they need to copyright everything. They need to have that as one of their resources. So what does the rest of the business model look like? Their customer said, can you see this? You want me to turn the lights off? Is that okay? So their main customers are the music fans. And I'm not saying everybody, just the fans, because their customers are the fans of the star artists or bands that they recruit. And their really poor position is the hits and also sometimes the wannabe hits. They take some chances every once in a while. How do they make money? You see the copyrighted content over here? They sell everything out of that copyrighted content. In what? In merchandising, in albums, in tours and concerts. So they take this, this handful of stars and make huge money out of it. And in order to be able to make their revenue stream sustainable, they copyright everything. They own everything. They have all the rights. The artists don't really don't usually make a lot of money compared to what they do. The rest of the business model. The activities are promotion and marketing of those stars. But before that, the biggest activity is scouting. Because in order to become sustainable, in order to be, be, still be relevant in years to come, they need to be constantly looking, for, looking out for new stars. Especially now with all the pop culture that we live in. There's one, one hit wonders. There's a band or a singer or whatever you hear about right now, which, which is a big thing, and two years from now, they don't exist. So their biggest activity is de de detecting and building talent, contracting talent. As early as possible, as late to the point of becoming a hit as possible, because they don't want to invest so too much on making them hits. So this contracting and detecting, this scouting, is their main activity. Where do they get their money from? They sell all this copyrighted content through TV channels, through retailers, through radio, uh, through digital mediums. Digital is a thing now, it was a thing back in the day, but right now they need to go along with the digital business. So they also distribute through digital. Where do they spend their money on? Basically, the biggest money, the biggest item of cost for those people are subsidizing for the artists and bands they recruit, but they cannot be stars. That's their biggest cost structure, cost item. Other than that, of course, there's marketing, marketing and promotion costs and also the royalty payments, which is actually very little, you'll be surprised, compared to the rest of the stuff. The money that they pay to the artists is really small, for example, compared to the subsidy to unsuccessful ones. The key partners, of course, are distribution channels because they need all those distribution channels to make a lot of sales. 
Uh, probably not, but I suggest you look at the long tail strategy by Anderson, which compares the sales of limited hit SKUs, which are really high in numbers, which creates big revenues, to the sales of really not so much hit SKUs, which is like the eBay model, but there's so many of those SKUs. They don't sell really good, but there's so many of them, so they create the same value at the end of the day. They create the same revenue at the end of the day. For these guys, they're at the, they're at the head of that curve. So they need to be selling a lot of what they have right now. They need to be selling a lot of the copyrighted content. So what they need in their business model, they need good uh, distribution channels. And also manufacturers, because they need to put this music on CDs and stuff. So this is the most traditional look at the music industry. Now the question is, when was the last time you listened to something? When was the last time you listened to music? Today Just last now. Just now? When was the last time you purchased a CD or an LP or something like that? LP? Most of them don't know LP. Well, it's coming back. It's coming back. Probably a long time ago. So there's something wrong with this business model right now. These guys have an issue because somebody, something else came up. Which brings us to the next business model, piracy. Uh, do you guys torrent or do P2P here to download music? Yeah, it started with Napster, now it's with torrent. It's, it's the same thing basically, it's a new business model. Somebody is making money out of it, so it's a business model. And it's a very viable business model. So what changed? What changed for piracy to become an important thing? What changes? The speed of internet went up. That was a huge thing. I mean, um, the modems in the first days of Napster had, I think, um, I think mean gigabyte per second. We were talking about kilobytes per second as per speeds, which was impossible to download albums yet today. But right now we're talking about incredible amounts of speeds on the internet, which wasn't possible back in the day when the record companies were a major thing. Also, the cost of internet went down. The speed went up, and obviously, as a consequence of that, the cost went down. And another thing happened, share economies started being a thing. Sharing is caring. This slogan was on, I see a laptop over there with a lot of stickers. And some of the stickers back in the day was a skull, a pirate, pirate flag, which had sharing is caring. That was a thing. And also, the most important thing, the music consumers became self-aware of what they want to have, what, what kind of value they want to get out of this. They were saying like, okay, I'm not a fan of any of those uh, artists that are being subsidized by major record companies, so I'm not, I don't have access to the music that I love. It, it just doesn't make sense to me. That was the idea behind the music fans. So they became self-aware. They, um, they started asking for the music that they like. They, they wanted, they demanded that their kind of music is available to them. Then came piracy. What happened with piracy, the biggest difference was, remember with the uh, record company business model, the consumer segment, the customer segments were the music fans, and the value proposition was the hits, or the wannabe hits. Those two changed, and those two little changes made the ripple effect, the butterfly effect on the whole business model. Actually, when I talk about business models, I only talk about two rules. One is this side has to be greater than or equal to this side, because it needs to make money. Even if it's a non-profit, that doesn't mean it's a non-revenue, it needs to make money. So this has to be greater than or equal to this. And the other rule is, if you change anything on this business model, it creates an effect on the remaining eight building blocks of it. In this case, in the music industry, there was a change on two of the very important business models, the value proposition and the customer segment. So what happened? The customer segment became the mass market. Whereas before, the only customer were the fans of the whole industry, the customers became everybody. And the value proposition was the hits. Right now, it has become all the, all the music in the world. So there were some major changes in the industry, major changes in the business model. So let's, let's get the rest of it. The channels, of course it was digital, 
you're downloading it. It's, that's why it's called piracy. You're not selling it from a record store. You're downloading it with your computer. So the channel is purely digital. And there was some relationship. If you notice in the record company business model, there was no relationship. There wasn't any actual customer relationship element to the record company business model. Right now there is, and it's called peer-to-peer. -peer. You download from somewhere. Okay, with torrenting, it's a different story because you download from many different sources, many different seats. But in the Netzer business model, in peer-to-peer -peer piracy business model, you knew exactly who you were downloading your music from. The revenue streams, all this is free. So where do they make revenue? This was pretty much, bless you, this was pretty much the first time that advertising started being a viable revenue stream for dot-com businesses. And this being the only revenue stream actually pretty much led to the dot-com burst back then. The cost structure, it's hosting. Because you need to have this digital framework, digital infrastructure somewhere fully running 24-7 every single day to be able to make this connection happen. Because again, when you think about early days of piracy, it took you a couple of days to be able to download the full album. So you need a sustainable, uh, reliable infrastructure to make it happen. The key activities were uploading and downloading, simple as that. So it was very user driven. You uploaded stuff for other people to share. Remember sharing is caring. And you download the stuff from other users, other peers within the network that have pretty much similar tastes with you. The key resources were, were the users themselves. The skills and commitment of the users. In some places, as it is right now, piracy is against the law. But still it has many users. So there was some commitment involved in there. There was some interest involved in there. So this was also because pretty much some part of a movement there as well. What are the key partners, the developers? And these users became the key partners. When you look at the Napster business model or a BitTorrent business model, you basically don't exist without the users. It's the users which make you relevant. So the users became one of the main, main key partners. So what's next? After some time, iTunes came. So what changed for iTunes to happen? Hardware and software became bundled. Before iTunes, hardware was something on its own created by Dell and IBM. And soft software was something on its own created by Microsoft. With iTunes, it was the hardware and software designed by the same people designed to work beautifully together by the same company. So it was bundled. By the way, when I say bundling, I suggest that you look at the industries and try to find the patterns of bundling and unbundling. Bundling and unbundling. Because there's actually, when you look at the uh, recent history of businesses, industries, you see a pattern that some industries become, the products, services, everything in that industry becomes bundled. And then, after a while, it becomes unbundled. Because somebody attacks a certain part of that industry, a certain part of that business model, and create, creates a better way to do that only this little part. And everybody else follows suit. So the bundled thing becomes unbundled. And after a while, uh, consolidation and other, other factors come into play, and then they become bundled. For example, have you, talk, have you heard about the, uh, the FinTech? Startups, you know what fintech is? It's financial technology startups. And this is actually unbundling of the financial services sector. All those fintechs are doing one thing in all of those financial services spectrum. But they're so cool and they're so great on doing that single one thing. So right now users of the financial services can get, their, get some of their services from a traditional bank another service from a startup in the United States, another service from uh, a direct banking solution of a local, local bank. So it's becoming unbundled. But after a while, you will see the same thing. Things, are, things will start to get bundled again. Things will come back together because somebody will say, hey, I, don't, I, I cannot carry too many passwords, I cannot memorize so many passwords. 
I need one single solution provider to do everything for me. And I just want to log into that. So it's going to be bundled again. This was the bundling phase of the music industry. So hardware and software became bundled. And also musical content became unbundled. So before that, you either bought an album or you downloaded whole albums. It was usually a zip file of the whole album. Now with iTunes, you could buy single tracks. I mean, all through my life listening to music, I'm a fan of rock and roll and heavy metal and all those kinds of music. I, I can think of only one album which I bought, put in my player, and liked every single song. Other than that, no. I'm a diehard Metallica fan, and there's not a single Metallica album which I like every song on it. With iTunes, you were able to buy single songs for 99 cents, <coughs> which is pretty much nothing. When you compare it to buying a whole album for uh, 12 songs, 11 of them, which you will never listen to it again. You will just fast forward. And also, anywhere, anytime consumption mentality happens. With the record company, you were you had to have a music player. You had to have a CD player, you had to have an MP3 player, you had to have a um, cassette player, if you're a dinosaur. Uh, with Napster, with uh, piracy, you had to have a computer. But with iTunes, you only had to have the iPod. And you could listen to your music on your iPod, you could listen to your music on your computer, you could listen to your music on the go, you could listen to your music anywhere. Anywhere, anytime, in any kind of situation. So what's cool about the iTunes business model? Again, it changes some things about the value proposition and customer segments. It was only the value proposition. They took all the music in the world, sliced some of it, because right now it's not all the music in the world, but it's beautiful experience you have with the music. So iTunes was the Starbucks moment of the music industry. In Starbucks, you don't buy coffee. You buy the coffee drinking experience. In iTunes, you don't listen to, you don't consume music. You experience music. With the white earphones, with the really nice wheel on the iPod. It's, it's actually a design process, a service design process, which became important. It was a valid proposition. When we look at the revenue stream, it was also a real, it, this iPod, iTunes business model also revolutionized the revenue stream. It had two distinct revenue streams. One was the device itself. They didn't sell, okay, it was a big hit, but compared to the songs, it wasn't that much. But it created big, big, big margins. It was really profitable to sell iPods. Because Apple, with all these design elements, were able to charge ridiculous amounts of money for their tiny devices. And some people say, um, in 2001, I believe, was the first time Steve Jobs introduced the iPod. They sell it's a technological innovation, but actually it's not. Because the exact same device named Rio from a company called Rio debuted in 1998. Three years ago, the MP3 player was available. And it was a fraction of the cost of the iPod of today. But with all these design elements, Apple was able to charge ridiculous amounts of money for those tiny, tiny devices. And they made huge margins out of it. But the biggest kick was downloading single songs on 99 cents. It was a big margin, but the volume was incredible. So the biggest revenue, in terms of revenue, was coming from uh, sales of content. The songs, the uh, podcasts, and all that stuff. Not a lot of margins, okay, but really big volumes. With the iPods, not that much volume, but huge margins, incredible profitability. Customer relationships with the design thing, with the design element, Apple created the love mark with the iPod. So the users actually loved the Apple brand. They didn't care what it was called iPod or iPod or IMP3. They didn't care as long as it had the Apple logo on the back. And also the biggest thing was the switching cost. Because with the iTunes, you took all your digital music, digital content, put it in a single place, which is your iTunes library, and if you want to switch to a different MP3 player, if you want to use Vinamp again, I don't know if you know Vinamp, but anyhow, it was pretty much impossible. 
because you had everything there. Now moving to a different platform became, became so big of a pain in the butt that nobody actually did it. The switching cost became the success factor of the iTunes business model. In terms of channels, of, of course there was no, not so much of an innovation there. It was iTunes, the digital channel, the retailers, the Apple stores, and Apple.com website. There was nothing new there. A lot of new stuff happened in key activities. This was pretty much the first time in the music industry, instead of X other than cover, uh, CD cover design, we saw design happening in the music industry. But right now it wasn't happening in the music itself, or the album itself. It was happening at the hardware and also the software. Also, marketing and sales was a huge thing for Apple. Otherwise, how can they create a long mark, right? We need to have marketing and sales to create a movement and to become a long mark. And also, big supply chain management. When you look at it, Apple is not that big of a technology company. Right now, it's doing everything, but iPhone users, uh, pretty much the majority of your phones are made by Samsung and it's created in Samsung factories or Samsung uh, first tier manufacturers, suppliers. This was also the case back in the iTunes day as well with the iPods. Apple pretty much didn't do much. It just designed the hardware and software. So there was a huge supply chain management aspect to this business model. The key resources of course was the software, the hardware, the content and the agreements. If you remember, the biggest change on the value proposition was the switch from all the world's music to seamless uh, design experience. It's not all the, all the world's music anymore because it's only the music that Apple has signed contracts with. So it's, it, Apple needs to sign contracts for the content to become available on the platform. And of course, uh, Apple brand and John Ive the uh, design chief at the day were the key resources. The costs, the manufacturing, I'm, I'm going to skip to this. Uh, design and development, the people, the marketing and sales, the manufacturing, and the royalties they pay to the content owners, which is the artists. By the way, pretty much at the same time, Apple introduced iTunes, and then Apple introduced GarageBand. Do you know the software? It basically enables everybody to create music. And really professional sound of music actually. And you can just uh, apply to iTunes and have your music available over there at 90, 99 cents a song. It was pretty much at the same time. That, that should come to you without surprise actually. It was just paving its way to create more content on its platform. The partners of course were the record labels. And it says OEMs here but it was actually Samsung which created pretty much everything for the iTunes to have. And after iTunes, we have Spotify. Same thing, maybe a different name. No, actually, some things, some fundamental shifts happened in the world and in the music industry to pave way for Spotify. What happened? The smartphone happened to start with. Uh, I don't know if you watched the introduction of iPhone by Steve Jobs, this, this really famous keynote. He says, I have three new products for you. A new portable music player, a communication device, and what was it? And something else. And he kept, he kept repeating it, he kept repeating it. And he said, do you guys see my point? It's actually one device that's capable of doing all those three things. The smartphone happened, which made the MP3 player, the digital music player, less relevant than before. The smartphone happened and it changed the world basically. Also, the free business model and the freemium business models gained um, popularity. What happened was the user said, okay, I don't want to buy this. If I'm not buying it, I don't want to pay for it. I don't want to pay for it. So the companies were like, okay, but we need to make money from somewhere. So you're a user of my product and you're not paying for me, so I'm going to sell you. And if you want out of this, you need to pay me. And users were like, okay, so which created the freemium business model. The, the effect of the coming uh, uh, trend of freemium happened. 
and multi-sided platform business models happened, which, was, which is actually the biggest thing even right now, is a business model which has two distinct, two or more distinctively separate customer segments, which distinctively separate value propositions, but the business model itself is a platform for those two different customer segments to meet and create business. Example? Can anyone give an example? Facebook? Yes. Airbnb. Uber. So, all those startups, all those new businesses, which you hear about in presentations, in keynotes, in seminars, in textbooks, and everything else, right now are most sided business models. So this happened. The ownership to access shift happened. So people said, I don't want to own this, because I'm listening to this track, Maybe I, I'm not even going to like it. I'm just buying for it, but I'm not going to like it. And after the first time, I will never listen to it again. I, just give me access to it. Just give me access to it so I can listen to it whenever I like. But I don't want to own this. No, I don't need this. I have too many signs. I only have this amount of space on my uh, little flash drive on my smartphone or MP3 player. I don't want to download this stuff anymore. Just give me access. And also the other thing, the, in, the internet speed going up and the cost coming down, the mobile internet speed became good enough to be able to stream high quality um, media. This includes music of course, but right now, especially after uh, April 1st, you will be able to stream um, high, uh, high definition, even sometimes 4K video on your smartphone. So this happened, the mobile internet revolution. This is actually the first sketch of the founders of Spotify. This pretty much says what they wanted to do. This explains the story of what they wanted to do. And what they wanted to do was provide music to everyone, absolutely everyone, at any time, at any place, free. And they will not need to download it. They will not need to pirate. This is going to be legal. This is what they based their whole business upon. The Nordic people can be crazy. So this was a company out of, out of uh, Sweden. So what's their business model? Okay, the customer segment is a mass market. The value proposition became not owning the music, not the design, but access to the music. Access to streaming to the music. But ta-da, multi-sided business model. There was another customer segment available in that, present at that business model, which was the advertisers. But the advertisers, for the customers who didn't want to pay for the service, those people, those poor souls, had to listen to this annoying ads in between songs. And if, and if they wanted this uh, torture to end, they need to pay up. And the advertisers had to shut up. So that was pretty much the revenue stream. It could be free, if you can endure the ads. Or you can pay some subscription fees for the advertisers to shut up. But if you're not paying anything for the service, then you're the service to the advertisers. And Spotify gets some fee ad fees from those advertisers. So that was the, this is in a nutshell actually, the most basic description of a multi-sided platform. Let's look at other elements of the business model. The channels, the desktop, the web application, and also the mobile application. So there's no physical element. Okay, these days Amazon is planning to open, okay, they started, they opened the store on 5th Avenue in New York, but right now they're planning on rolling out their store concepts. Spotify is still a pure digital platform. They don't have any physical channels. Even iTunes have physical channels because they sell iTunes certificates on technology retailers, even grocery retailers, and Apple stores. With Spotify, you don't need that. Everything happens online. So you have the desktop channel and the mobile channel, and that's it. That's enough. The customer relationship is pretty much uh, self-service. So if you need to find some information, if you need some help, you go to the website or you go to the app, and you take care of your problem right there with the content that's already available on the platform. It's a third party APIs which create the relationship. So Spotify created the platform. But also, in the meantime, open parts of that platform to third-party developers. 
which enabled them to create additional value for the users, which became part of the customer relations. And also the community, because with Spotify, you can't follow me. There's a community, there's actually real users which are saying, I like this, I like that, I like this, I'm listening to this right now. And you can just go ahead and follow those people. Just eardrop on what they're listening, what they like, and maybe create a taste of your own, discover new stuff. So there was a community of music lovers which became the basic relationship actually. The key activities of course was the development and maintenance of the platform. With multi-sided business models, you always see this as the key activity, the platform, the maintenance of it, and the development of it is the key activity. And key resources, the platform again, the brand, the engineering behind all this stuff, and the licensing agreement. Again, this has to be legal. That was the purpose of Spotify, it has to be legal. So Spotify needs to do some licensing with uh, the content owners. Um, I, I don't know if it's still the case, but there was a, a war between Spotify and Taylor. It was Taylor something, the singer. And her content right now is not on Spotify. I told you I'm a Metallica fan, so I don't know the last thing, so it makes sense. She's not on Spotify because they couldn't sign her, basically. But you can still download it, you can still torrent her. But it's not on Spotify. So licensing is still a big activity. The cost structure are the royalties that they give to those content owners, the salaries that they give to their people, and the bandwidth. And the bandwidth is actually a big thing for Spotify. Because when you look at it, um, there's music on some server or on cloud distributed servers. But at any given time, there can be only one request or no request from users to stream that song or millions and billions of users trying to stream the same thing. So it creates a big burden on the infrastructure, it creates a big burden on the bandwidth. If you're thinking about starting a streaming business or cloud business, keep that in mind. Especially today, when there are active sanctions on the bandwidth speeds and costs put on us by the state. Bandwidth can sometimes be really expensive and really difficult to achieve. The key partners, of course, with the Spotify is the right holders. Without them, this cannot be happening. But the uh, right holders are not customers because customers are the, the music fans. This was a um, Spotify business model with some post-its. And this is what it looks like when you start drawing. By the way, I'm not, this is not part of the messages at the end of the stack, but my message to you is, when you're working with business models, if you can draw stick figures, draw. Try to visualize it. Because the business model comes actually a design tool. Not a business plan. It's a design tool. So what creates what creates the design atmosphere better than drawing instead of writing? And when you think about it, Drawing is the essence of human communication. The whole civilization was created by cavemen which started drawing on cave walls. Before birds, there were images. And you don't even have to go prehistoric. Just look at your own childhood. Before you started writing, before you learned to write the language, before you mastered the language, you were, write, you were drawing silly stuff on pieces of paper. So writing is actually the purest form of communication for us. So try to draw as much as possible. So my question to you is, maybe you can use it as a homework or I don't know, if you want. What about Apple Music? Apple Music, is it just a Me Too strategy? Apple's reaction to the likes of Spotify, Last.fm, Pandora, um, SoundCloud, or is there actually something really specific about Apple Music which earns its place in the competition? Is it a new business model in the music industry? Or is it just a, a, either a good or a poor uh, mimic of the Spotify business model? Think about this. Try to use the business model accounts as a tool to put Spotify and Apple Music side by side and try to see how you can differentiate the two. Spotify users? Apple Music users? 
apparently there are some differences. My biggest point today is you're all designers. You may be studying business, you may be studying design, you may be studying engineering, but you're all designers. Because the basic definition of design is um, dreaming of something and creating something that currently doesn't exist. It's the process that I'm thinking like that that makes you a designer. So my first and most important message to you, to, to you today is you're all designers. You just have to practice. Because you forget about this. I mean, to be honest, up until the point you entered university, you had a certain level of creativity which, which was growing and growing. And right now, you're, you're, you're going down the hill. You're killing it with our educational system. But in essence, you're all designers because you create stuff, you dream stuff which currently don't exist. And this is by definition what a designer is. Don't forget that. that Get those habits back. Get those creativity, dreaming habits back. This is what you need for entrepreneurship. This is what you need for the business. When designing businesses, design for the people. Don't design for the bottom line. Don't design for how much money you want to make or how much profit you need. Design for the people. Design for value. The record company business model was designed for the activity. Designed for the product. Selling a lot of stuff. The rest, which revolutionized the <coughs> industry, was designed for people. It was solutions to people's needs and questions and frustrations, and the music industry changed. A lot of industries changed that. The hotel chain is a business designed to maximize efficiency of a huge asset investment. Airbnb is a business designed to increase the customer experience of the homeowners and the tourists. So, design for the people. Design for tomorrow. The micro trends of today are uh, mega trends of tomorrow. This is also a cliche, but it's also true. Design for tomorrow. And when you design for tomorrow, somebody will say, yeah, yeah, I heard about 3D printing. 3D printing is never going to be a thing because we did the feasibility study and it just doesn't work out for us. What they did was they took their current business model, which is based on machine work, established factories and machining and all that, and replaced all the machines and substituted 3D printers. Well, hello, of course it's not going to work. Because the 3D printing thing, business model, is not going to be the same as the current manufacturing business model. What is coming? And it's going to disrupt certain manufacturers. I don't know who, but it's going to disrupt certain manufacturers. So design for tomorrow, it's actually already here. You can see it. So before this lecture, we, we were talking about uh, self-driving buses working between two villages in Greece. Great example, man. I was at a major uh, commercial vehicle manufacturer during a meeting, and what they said was, okay, we did the feasibility of electric cars and self-driving cars, it's never gonna work for commercial vehicles. And it's actually, it's working in Greece right now in some rural area between two villages. And this is the perfect story, the first chapter of the story of disruptive innovation. Tomorrow is already here. So design for it. See it. You can, you can look around and see it for yourself. Design with purpose. The vision, the purpose is a huge element on your business success, on your entrepreneurial success. Sometimes it's not clear to you, it's, it may seem less obvious or less important to you, but I suggest when you go on an entrepreneurial pursuit, uh, put your purpose in front of you. Because at the end of the day, as founders, as entrepreneurs, you are the people who's, who is going to make that happen. So you need to be believing in what you're doing. Design the purpose. And the purpose should be somewhere in the lines of, I want to make the world a better place. Give or take. I'm not saying you all have to be tree huggers or uh, philanthropists, but you need to change something in the world. You need to create an impact in the world. Design with that purpose. And people will follow you, communities will follow Another thing from Master Yoda, uh, there is no trying on this. You do it or don't do it. So I suggest if you have an idea, 
if you want to do something, if you want to change the world in any way possible, if you want to make an impact, just do it. Actually, I was at a keynote for a very famous um, speaker, and he said, just effing do it, like 27 times during his keyword. Just do it. That's the most important thing. If you have an idea about a startup or a new venture, if you want to be an entrepreneur, and you've had this idea for three years now, you're already too late. Just get out and do it. There's no trying. It's not like, you cannot do this health bitterly. You have to commit to this and just do it. You will find a way to do this. But you will never know unless you don't start. And just fly away with your business models. That's my last thing. I know we disagree on uh, to forge at this point, but uh, I would say, I would dare say, don't waste too much time on business plans. Do your business model. It, it easily translates to a business plan. It's, it has all the fundamentals of a business plan, but do your business model. Work on it. It's a tool. It's not a goal. It's not a goal to achieve. It's a tool for you to be able to create the biggest value for your customers. Use it as a tool. Master the tool and just fly away with it. And I guarantee you will find a way to make your startup, make your venture be successful. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Corkut. Now, ladies and gentlemen, any questions?